Imagine that a company comes to you and says, we've developed a revolutionary new engine oil. You're skeptical, but you're willing to try it out. They give you the oil, and it looks like this. It's got a bit of a greenish tinge to it. And you think, well, plenty of companies put dyes in their oils for marketing purposes, but what's special about this? So you do an oil analysis test and you find zinc, zero parts per million. Phosphorus, zero parts per million. Calcium, zero. Magnesium, zero. And at this point you're thinking, do they just sell me base oil and forget to put the additives in? Then copper turns up at 250 parts per million. That's unusual because usually copper in something like an engine oil is a bad thing. It's indicative of bearing wear, but 250 is extraordinarily high, so it must mean the additive package. There's no TBN to speak of, so very little in the terms of detergency. Then you've got an acid number that starts off two. That's all completely backwards from everything we know about engine oils. And the killer? Saps. 0.07% by weight. That's, for all intents and purposes, zero when you compare it to both the mid and the low saps engine oils that are currently available on the market. Now, if you've been following this channel for the last couple of months, you'll know that I came across a startup company who thinks that they've cracked a new kind of way of approaching engine oils. And we spent the first episode kind of discussing how it's supposed to work in theory. And then we tested out on a very small scale. So we bought a motorbike engine and had it run at a third party independent testing laboratory. This time, we're scaling up. So we've validated that it works in a motorbike engine and we want to prove that it works in a much heavier duty application. So this small startup company called Neo Copper Technologies put their money where their mouth is and they bought themselves a Cummins X12 heavy duty diesel engine. They took it to a third party independent testing laboratory. It's a German outfit that's well known in our circles. And they had it run on a test stand and hooked this thing up to all kinds of instrumentation so that we could get readings on everything from friction, wear, as well as emissions, power, and torque output. Now let's step back for a little bit and ask ourselves, why is this actually a big deal? Why, why do we need kind of a step change in engine oil technology? When you look at the way that engine oils are formulated, they really start off with kind of a, a known chemical box. If you look at any oil analysis test, you'll tend to find that they contain zinc, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, moly, and boron in some relative proportions. And if you looked at some of the early engine oil formulations, they contained a stack of zinc and phosphorus. Remember, they are the Z and P in ZDDP, as well as calcium, which provided both the TBN as well as the detergents. As we've moved on, we've slowly started to reduce the amount of zinc and phosphorus, and that's for emissions control reasons, but we were always playing at the margins, and maybe we were using primary instead of secondary ZDDPs, and we were altering the chemistry a little bit to refine it a little bit more. Then as we moved on, we might have elevated the amount of boron. That might have been because ZDDP is both an anti-wear as well as an antioxidant. And, you know, sometimes we have to compensate with performance either from some kind of borated ester, or maybe instead we were adding some other kind of antioxidant to the formulation. Then, for example, we might have reduced the amount of zinc and phosphorus, but made up for it with moly. We know now that moly and zinc work what we call synergistically together. So it gives you a one plus one equals three effect. And that's often why you'll see moly in, in some of the more modern engine oils. Then we moved on to turbocharged direct injection engines. We found that LSPI was a problem. So we're having to pull back on the calcium and increase the amount of magnesium detergents. Now let's say you wanted a very low saps formulation. Well, ash is created by metallic components. If you pull down on the zinc and you want to keep the phosphorus high, the only way to do that is to use ashless anti-wear that is phosphorus based. And then maybe you compensate for the loss of antioxidants by increasing the amount of boron or increasing the amount of some other antioxidant. The point is that we're always playing at the margins. So you could say that an exercise in engine oil formulation, we're really just kind of adjusting levers up and down. What Neil is suggesting is that we need to wipe the slate clean and introduce a completely new chemistry. Now, if you're going to introduce a new chemistry, you have to validate that number one, it works, and number two, it's not gonna cause any harmful effects to the engine. And so that's what this is really all about. Now, for this to be believable and credible, we have to have a very rigorous testing regime. So we're gonna start with a new engine that needs to be broken in and commissioned. And so we'll start with a standard OEM approved oil, run the engine on that for a little while, and then we're gonna do a handful of what we call functional tests. Now those functional tests are to test things like 
power, torque, and temperature to make sure that when it's running on the Neol oil, it's comparable to the OEM approved oil. Then looking at a mapping test, so brake specific fuel consumption. So what Neil is trying to show you here is, okay, maybe the performance of the oil stacks up, but if you have to pay for that with an increase in fuel consumption, then that's not a very good trade-off. So showing that the brake specific fuel consumption stays even is very important. Friction torque, to be able to demonstrate that we're not adversely introducing a whole bunch of friction into the engine, and if we can get a friction benefit, then that's an absolute advantage. Obviously, one of the reasons why we're looking at a low SAPS formulation is for emissions criteria. And so what we want to demonstrate with an additional test is that there is no adverse effect on emissions. Finally, we need to do some oil analysis to prove that the oil is in good nick and identify if there's any wear metals. And finally, a cylinder endoscopy, or you might call it a boroscope, is going to confirm the condition of the inside of the engine. So that's the testing criteria for these three functional tests. And after going through it all and a number of different drains, here's what I think are some pretty encouraging results. So the first test is engine power. How much power is the engine producing over basically the entire rev range? And what they were able to show was, if anything, there was actually a slight increase in engine power. Now, I don't know that the number was large enough that you could say it's statistically significant, but at the very least, there's no decrease in engine power as a result of using this new chemistry. Then we obviously want to check torque. Torque and power, intimately related. And again, checking over the entire rev range, there was a very slight increase in torque over the rev range. Like I said, we want to check brake specific fuel consumption. And here, the difference is almost negligible. 182 grams per kilowatt hour versus 183 grams per kilowatt hour. In terms of friction, again, very little difference between the Neol chemistry as well as the OEM approved oil. So again, that's good, right? It's showing that we're not entirely dependent on that old chemistry to get the results that we want. And then finally, we had the emissions test in which it was run over both a cold as well as a hot standardized cycle. They measured all the emissions and were able to show there was no significant difference between the emissions on the OEM approved oil as well as this new Neol technology. Okay, so now you've got the performance criteria at the, out of the way. One of the next things that you wanna do is test engine durability. And really the way to do that on a test stand is to do it through what we would call an OEM endurance test. So we run the engine at fairly heavy load for a very long period of time and see what the results are. And here is where I think things get quite interesting. Because look at the oil analysis results. I've now got on screen both the new as well as the used 10W30 engine oil. And there's a couple of things that we can tease out. So as uh, oil enthusiasts, you might say, there's a couple of things that I think will be super interesting to the audience. Number one, we said that TBN was close to zero, and what they're showing is that the new oil has a TBN of about 1.1. One thing we know is that when you get to very, very low TBN levels, it's actually quite difficult to measure TBN, and there's a lot of inaccuracy that occurs at low TBN levels. So I wouldn't put too much stock in that. Effectively, there is no overbase detergent in this formulation. So that's the first thing to note. The second thing to note is that the total acid number actually went down. Now this is highly unusual, not only in engine oils, but in lubricants in general, because generally acid number goes up as the result of contaminants. So in fuels, if we burn things like sulfur, we produce H2SO4, which is sulfuric acid, and we create oxidation products as the byproduct of exposure to air as well as high temperatures, and the acid number increases. In the very rare circumstances where total acid number decreases, it's generally because there are acidic components in the oil, that is to say, acidic additives, and as they are consumed, the acid number goes down. Now, I can tell you, and I haven't shown it on the screen here, that the oxidation value stayed basically zero throughout this test, and I wouldn't have expected it to go up by a whole lot. All we're saying is very little oxidation that has occurred, and why do we care about oxidation? because we care about changes in viscosity. And as you can see here, the KV100, which is the top line, has stayed pretty stable. Okay, one other thing that's very interesting is the ash number. Okay, like I said, 0 0.07, 0 0.06, it's effectively zero. Up until this point, we haven't really had anything that's below about 0.4, right? And that's almost a tenfold increase from where we are now. And I'll explain why that's so important at the end of the video. Then we've got water. This formulation seems to be quite hygroscopic, which is to say it pulls water out of the atmosphere. 
And you'll see that the new oil value had a water value of about 380, and it reduces in use. That would suggest that when the engine gets up to operating temperature, it's starting to boil some of that water off. Now we get into the wear metals. Now iron in the used oil sample looks a little bit high at 90 parts per million, but remember this is a relatively new engine and it's still going through the running in process. If you've got questions, hold that thought because I've got more to show you in a second. Copper is really interesting because obviously in this circumstance, it's an additive and not a wear metal or a contaminant. Typically when we see very high levels of copper in heavy duty diesel engines, we would be concerned, right? Because it's either corrosion of the oil cooler or it's wear of the bearings. In this case though, a very high number is reflective of the additive package. Next you've got boron. Now, in this case, boron seems to be some kind of additive and it's depleted quite a lot. It's gone from 256 down to 25. Again, hold that thought. We're gonna explain a little bit more in a second. And then finally, on the standard items that you would typically see in an oil additive package, virtually zero. Now you might wonder, why are we seeing 16, 10, and 12 on calcium, phosphorus, and zinc for the used oil? And that's really residual that was left over from the original oil that was in the engine and which the engine was running on. So that's the OEM approved oil. Now we've got one more surprise in store because after we had done all of the testing, so all the functional testing as well as endurance testing, Neil said, why don't we try and pull one more trick out of the bag? Let's see what happens if we reduce the viscosity a bit. Can our specialized copper anti-wear additive compensate for the slight loss in viscosity? And will we see the same kind of performance out of a 0W30 rather than a 10W30? And again, I think the results are really interesting. So first of all, you can see that the KV100 is slightly lower for the 0W30. But this time, this is why I said, just hold on to your opinions about iron for a moment, because now that the engine has been completely run in, the levels of iron wear are now sitting around about 19. So that's really good considering that we've dropped the viscosity slightly. In a, in a similar way, the boron additive hasn't depleted as much, and that's probably got to do with the fact that now the engine's been running on the same kind of chemistry for a little while. Remember, this is a radically different chemistry from the standard oils that you will see on the market today. And finally, because all of that original approved OEM oil is now out of the system, the standard additive levels of calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, and zinc, they're all now zero. Now, oil analysis is all well and good, but you also have to show that the engine looks good on the inside. So they did have a look on the inside, and I'd say that these images look pretty clean. Uh, now, the engine's not super old, so you're not expecting a huge amount of wear, but again, this is validation that we can run an engine on an entirely different additive chemistry than what is currently available on the market. Now, the big question is, why is this significant? Like, why do we actually care about this? No one asked for a completely clean slate engine oil. Now, the reason this is significant is we have been chasing lower saps formulations for the last 30 to 40 years. We know that phosphorus and sulfur poison catalysts. We know that the ash clogs DPF filters. And so everyone has been looking to minimize these levels. But if you look at the evolution, for example, of the ASEA sequences, you can see from 2002 all the way through to 2022, the E sequences for heavy duty engines, the limits have not significantly changed since 2002. In 2002, we set a maximum level of saps by weight at 2%. And all that we did in 2004 is release E6, which had a 1% maximum. Since then, most heavy duty diesel engine oils max out that level. So if they want an E6 or an E9 or an E11 or an E8, they use 1% ash. Now, I only know of a single company that has really chased what they call an ultra low saps additive package. And that's Chevron or Caltex, uh, depending on what region you're in. Their Delo 600ADF, that product has an ash level of 0.4% by weight. So what we're doing here is we're showing a drastic drop. Because the thing is, if, you, if we continue along this trajectory, where everyone either has an allowable value of two or one, tweaking at the margins of the currently available technology is never gonna get us to a proper zero saps formulation. It's only by wiping the slate clean and starting over again that we can get anywhere near that level in the next decade or two. Now that's why I think this is a really, really big deal. 
Now the story is not done. One test, albeit a very comprehensive test, one test does not prove that this is a technology which can completely upend the rest of the world. It gets us some of the way there, but there's still a lot of more evidence that needs to be built. And Neil is completely committed to this, so they're already looking at the next round of testing. And if you happen to have a fleet and maybe want to test this out in the real world, then definitely get in touch, because at some stage, this is gonna to have to make its way into fully fledged vehicles, and we're gonna to need to do real world uncontrolled testing. This really is a very promising new engine oil technology, and I'm really excited to see where it leads us.